Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Um, okay, my name is Bruce Williams. Um, I'm going to be talking about the next Ruby, which is Ruby 1.9. So, first of all, to uh, give you a little bit of background on me, that's my name in big red letters at the top. And uh, I live here in Austin, Texas. So, yeah! seriously? Okay. So, as you can tell, we have a very large and vibrant Ruby community here. Um, with very small voices. <laughs> so um, we, are the community here is growing uh, at a pretty at a pretty good rate, and uh, but it's nice to have all of you all of you here. Um, so you know, grab somebody from Austin if you're looking for a good restaurant or a good bar. There's plenty of both. Um, I've been a Rubyist since 2001, back when you didn't make any money doing it, and it was just a lot of fun. And now you can make money doing it, and it's still a lot of fun. Um, so that worked out really well. I'm a language tourist, and what I mean by that is um, I'm a Rubyist by trade, and it's, the, it's the, my tool of choice. But I play with Erlang, I play with Haskell, I play with whatever makes sense. Um, Ruby has a long lineage, um, and uh, you know, we, we owe a lot to a lot of languages, and I think, it, think we should you know, float around a little bit and take a look at other languages as well. So, if you had to distill my life in a series of URLs, those would be probably them. Um, that's where I blog when I blog, which is probably not as much as I should. Um, you can find me on GitHub there, using my name. I work at a company called Five Runs, which is here. Um, we have the TuneUp and the Manage products, which you can see to the right. And uh, I basically just annoy people and talk about what I'm eating for dinner and things like that at my, my Twitter. I can't claim that there's anything useful that comes out of that, um, but there it is. So why Ruby 1.9? Why care about Ruby 1.9? Um, how many people here are using 1.8.6 most of the time, MRI? Okay, keep your hands up. Okay, now if you're using 1.8.7, keep your hands up. Okay. How about 1.9? <laughs> How about 1.9 in production? Dave, Dave, you don't count. You're an early, early, early adopter. <laughs> so actually, um, recently, oh, yeah. OK, Dave, I guess you do count. But only because you paid. <laughs> so um, Ruby 1.9. Uh, uh, Ruby Inside recently did a poll. I don't know if any of you took part in it. Um, but they found a good, pretty good percentage of people. Yeah, I guess about 10, 10%, 15% last time I looked, and now the poll is gone, so I can't find it, um, which is perfect for me because I'm speaking about it today. But about 10 or 15% are using Ruby 1.9 on a, on a regular basis. So I, thinking back a little bit, um, Ruby 1.9 reminds me a lot of Ruby 1.7 because it's a development version of Ruby. So back when everybody was using 1.8.6, there was 1.8.7, and people played in the world of 1.8.7 before, uh, sorry, in the world of 1.7 uh, before 1.8 came out. Um, it's a little bit different now because people have businesses that rely on 1.8, so they're a little less willing to go forward willy-nilly and you know, grab stuff, because we're very much into robust enterprise software in this community, obviously. So. 1.9, um, however, does a lot of stuff for us. So we get a whole bunch of new syntax and language features. <coughs> Obviously, it's a, <coughs> as the next version, it's not strictly backwards compatible with 1.8. There's definitely some issues when you're migrating code, which I'm going to go into. Um, it definitely has better performance characteristics. And of course, it has more bucks, because that's just the way software works. Although it's probably easier to maintain these days. So what I am going to talk about, what I'm not going to talk about. I'm, I am going to talk about the new syntax and language features because that's what I really enjoy talking about. I am going to talk about you know, migrating stuff over. I'm not going to talk about the performance. That's something that you can, people that are far smarter than me and more interested 
in performance, you can find loads of numbers about the various implementations and various speeds um, out there. And uh, 1.9 as a whole is much, much faster than MRI 1.8. So I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I'm not going to talk about the bugs that exist um, besides the one that have immediately popped up to me because I'm not psychic and I don't know where they are. If I was, I would be helping Mats uh, fix them, but that's not the case. So, um, still on the thread of things I'm not going to talk about. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the other implementations of Ruby, most of which target 1.8 anyways, uh, with the exception of Mac Ruby, which has the benefit of sitting on top of 1.9 anyhow. Um, I'm going to be talking about YAR, so yet another Ruby VM, which is 1.9. So just the plain vanilla Ruby. Not that I'm not excited about those other implementations, because I am. So, obviously, um, don't go out and grab 1.9 right now, if you, if you could. Um, this is where you would go and grab it. It's being, 1.9 is in Subversion these days. I think 1.8 is a branch uh, as well that you can track in Subversion if you want to get it edge. Um, it's still changing on a regular basis. It's certainly a more stable than it used to be. Um, okay. The klaxon, I guess, was because it used to be very unstable. So the, uh, you can get 1.9.0 um, directly from the downloads page and from Subversion, and that's essentially how you build it. Um, make sure you build it with some type of program suffix or something like that so you don't get very confused about what Ruby is on your system. I use 1.9 as mine. So a little bit about the, uh, a little bit about the standard library. And I, uh, I apologize, it's a little out of date. This is, I've done this, a version of this talk um, a couple times, and this one didn't get updated very well, so there, there may be some stuff here that's, that's different. But um, in general, what you have is um, Ruby, Ruby gems are now part of the standard library. They're built in, so are Rake, JSON, Ripper, et cetera, that you can see here. Um, some of these may seem a little crazy. Um, you may not know what Pro Profiler is, for instance. I don't really either. Um, Secure random for those of you that are um, SRAN Nazis. This one is for you. Um, if you really want random, here's, here's one for you to look at. And of course, the HMAC digests. So um, CSV was replaced by the faster CSV implementation, which I believe we have someone to thank for that. Um, and that's a vast improvement. And then in things that have disappeared, at least the last time that I looked, SOAP, WSDL, and Base64, and some of the much older libraries have disappeared. Backing away. Um, so uh, for Base64, we're going to take a look at Pack and Unpack. OK, so we're going to talk about risk factors now. So parts of your code that you're going to have a problem converting over to 1.9, because you're going to do it eventually, and you should at least be looking at it. So the first thing that I'll say is that you need tests. If you don't have tests now on your code, first of all, you should have tests on your code. Um, you have to have tests because people at conferences will annoy you to death anyhow if you don't have tests. And uh, BDD, 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 because that needs to be said at least three times in every talk. Um, because it's new and cool and life-changing. Um, so, actually, I, I like it as a concept, not as a buzzword. So yeah, write tests. Um, actually, James Edward Gray had a great uh, quote in a Ruby talk thread many months ago about when he was switching over faster CSV to 1.9 and talked a little bit in that about the fact that there was a lot of issues that you didn't realize that were there that your tests really, really helped you find. So, and that's something that I just keep coming back to when I've been converting some stuff over to see how it works. If I didn't have my tests, it'd be a hell of a lot harder to find these things. I mean, with Ruby, obviously you're not gonna find some bugs unless some branches of code are being executed. So the idea is get those branches to execute. And uh, tests are the way to do that. So this is a really big one in 1.9, is text processing. So if you're writing parsers, faster CSV is a good example of, 
of this kind of stuff. Um, Regal parsers, for instance, uh, and hpricot and, and mongrel, et cetera, um, are also good examples. Well, not necessarily with, with mongrel, but. So you've got, um, the issue now is that we have this, first of all, we have new encoding support, and now when you're using the string sub method, when you're indexing into a string um, with a single index, you're gonna get a character back. You're not going to get a number back, which you know, is kind of what most of us have expected anyhow. This is the thing that we've brought up for years and years and said, yeah, yeah, when you index into a string, you get back a number back and that's okay. So that's gone now. We don't have to have that conversation with people, but we do need to convert over the code that relies on it. So we have some, now you can actually have different encodings for your actual source files, which is kind of cool. Um, if you're also a closet linguist like I am, that's kind of a neat thing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wonder who that is. I have a wife and two kids. And it's during my talk. That's okay. So. Okay, where was I? Thank you, dear. So, um, encodings, yes. So yeah, we have these new encoding, encoding conventions. That's kind of an extra feature that I'll go into in a little bit. Um, but you certainly do new, need to know about string ord um, and various unpacks. Unpack C star, unpack U star. Um, just be familiar with unpack in general and pack as well. Um, it's just, they're very, very powerful and they're good to know about. Some examples of this in action um, with Ruby 1.8 and Ruby 1.9, what you get out of things. Um, generally in Ruby 1.8, to get what you see in Ruby 1.9, you do something like 0 dot dot 1 or 0 comma 1, or this uh, dot chr. So major difference there. Not backwards compatible at all. Um, the approach that has been recommended for people, that, for instance, that are doing regal parsers is just unpack your string into numbers and use them. So convert one way or the other way or use character or to pull stuff out. Um, below that, you've got a little bit of Arabic and I'm pulling the same kind of stuff out. On the left-hand side, I'm only pulling out a byte, so it doesn't really work nicely for me. On the right-hand side, um, on the right-hand side, it actually pulls out the multi-byte character, which is kind of nice. Um, this is obviously using some encoding trickery. Uh, now, granted, actually typing this in TextMate with a bidirectional text and trying to put an index on the end was a complete nightmare. So what I've actually done is I've actually taken the string and then taken the thing next to it and sat it next to it so it looks like it should. TextMate gets a little confused by bidirectional. So for those of you who just are dying to type Arabic, um, you know, your time isn't here yet. So, yeah, sorry. I know that, that just cuts out half the audience. So, um, you see some unpack stuff here with actually pulling out the um, Unicode uh, multibytes. And, you know, RI unpack to see all, all of the crazy options there. <coughs> If you do C star, you get a bunch of crazy negatives uh, for, the, for the Arabic word, so it's not very helpful. So this is another one. This is one sh that should only really affect you if you're insane anyhow. Um, so there's this really neat trick. It's very clever. Um, I always put clever in quotes whenever possible because I, it's a synonym for stupid. But um, this kind of stuff. And usually this is a bug that somebody just hasn't realized um, in 1.8 that they're accidentally assigning to a variable that's outside the scope um, using a block argument. Usually that's a bug. You do see some people do crazy things like actually assigning to an instance variable inside of a block for some insane reason um, because Ruby's a new toy and it's shiny and it's pretty and they can do crazy stuff with it. Um, so this shouldn't exist in any code that you ever show anybody else. But, so you see the output difference here. The very last loop is going to assign, the very last yield is going to assign item, 
and outside it's going to exist as four after the loop. On the right hand side, the uh, the block the block variable it is it is going to, that assignment's not going to take place because block variables are always local. It is going to shadow. It is going to warn you if you're using Ruby dash W, which you should be using. So, uh, yeah, you're going to want to name your variables inside the inside your block something different anyway, so you actually know what's going on. Going back a step, if there's anything here that's, yeah. So, in the solution, it's just don't do that. Um, we're not going to talk about error lambdas quite yet. We'll talk about those in a little bit, or pointy lambdas, whatever you want to call them. Um, but there's a way of actually declaring a variable as local so that you can use it inside without assigning outside. Um, so just pretend that that little, um, little arrow there, which Rain calls dash rocket, which don't even get me started, um, is is lambda. So inside of there, you can see you're reassigning D, and on that side, uh, you aren't because you're declaring as local. But you will still get the shadowing warning. Okay, this is kind of cool. This is another one of those things that um, is kind of the principle of least surprise has, has changed, and uh, it, it makes me happy. So hash select actually returns hashes now which is nice, because now you don't have this in array of arrays, um, which I used to just dot, flatten, and splat to, to, to hash, um, so that I can create a new hash out of it. So you were doing this thing where you're creating an array and making a hash. And this just basically follows the principle that when you do a select on a hash, you really just want a subset of what the hash is, and yes, you still want a hash. So the good news is that you can probably remove code to, to, take, to migrate this code because you're probably having to generate a hash again and go through it, and now you can remove that piece. But you might be expecting an array back, and you might be doing other things with it, so be careful. So the cool thing is now, if you had, a, for instance, a hash called conferences, you could select on it and pull stuff out. And another issue um, is that arity does matter on select. So. In the past, if you only had one block argument, it would get both the key and the value assigned to it. And nowadays, it looks out. So, uh, Sam Ruby, actually, I originally did this uh, did this talk uh, at Scotland on Rails uh, in Edinburgh, which is another great regional conference on across the ocean, and. Uh, I put out a PDF and people looked at it and it was on Ruby Inside and Sam Ruby recently came out and did another talk. Um, he's much more focused on the string encoding stuff, which is cool because it's not a strong area for me. And, um, but this is a really good point that he made, is that one of the main obstacles for us as a community deciding 1.9 is cool and we can use it, especially in production applications, is the fact that we have all these gems out there who, you know, it's not like it's not like we're Red Hat Enterprise Linux where we have some kind of idea of what the maintenance status is of any given thing at any given moment. And uh, th these are just sitting around and they might have 1.8 code that's not compatible. So you get 1.9, you install some gems, and some of your dependencies aren't working right. So that's a real problem for us. Um, so as a community, we need to do something about that. We need to identify these. Now, now certain things, for instance, Rails runs fine on 1.9, meaning its dependencies run fine on 1.9. And at least what 37 Signals is using probably runs fine on 1.9, since I know they're using it to some degree. So, and that's great. But there's a lot of other stuff that you may be using. Maybe you do things like uh, uh, document preparation or something like that, and you have some crazy list of gems that you use that are really arcane that nobody outside of your industry uses. And it had one maintainer who, in 2004, slapped together a gem and tossed it out, and then he disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, you're going to need to do something about that if you want to continue to use your software with 1.9. So no easy solutions there. So new features. We'll talk a little bit about the, mostly the syntax changes, some of the encoding changes. I don't want to go too deep there. Um, and this is kind of the cool stuff. So M17N. Um, obviously there's a lot of, I try not to put a lot of text on the slide, but here it is. So versus me just reading it, 
read yourself. Um, kind of the main points here is that strings have encodings nowadays um, that your source files can actually have an encoding. Um, you can actually read things in encodings. Uh, that encoding affects a lot of things. It affects things like regular expressions, uh, various methods on string. Um, you can't just do dot each on strings these days. Uh, you've got each character and each line and um, each byte, I think, is another one that's out there. You can take a look at what the encoding is on a string. You also have um, different ways of setting what your encoding is on a source file. You can use, um, there's some, well, there's some, there's some command line stuff I think you can do from Ruby, but also from the actual CLI. But there's also magic comments that you can throw up in various formats. So if you have the Emacs style comment because you use Emacs, um, you can use that. If you have the misfortune to use Vim, I'm sure there's something for that as well. Um, and if you use TextMate, uh, you know, whatever else, there's just plain basic, basic versions uh, that don't give any hints. And obviously, I already talked talk to you a bit about string sub and how to pull stuff out of a string. So it supports a lot of different encodings. This, is, this was a complete list as of a few months ago. It might be different nowadays. Um, so there's a lot of stuff here. Um, UTF-8 is obviously the big one for, for most people that want to do um, stuff across languages. So being able to pull stuff out of files, doing I.O. stuff with, uh, with different encodings, um, that's, no, that's now possible directly. Kind of nice. Um, you'll notice in the uh, second example, I'm also using an open version of the new, new hash symbol trick thing, which is, uh, kind of reminds you of keyword arguments probably, maybe a little bit of JSON, or JavaScript at least. Probably pretty self-explanatory. So that's, this is a really, really cool feature. And this is one of the features that's on that, that, on that enterprise checkbox that people apparently pass around that you have to have checked off for you to make money. So this is a good thing. Um, this is the thing people complain about a lot, is the fact that we don't have support for, for Unicode, et cetera, et cetera. And that's been a big complaint, and a valid complaint for a number of years. So um, it's been worked on. We're going to continue to work on it. So this is really cool, because if you're a text processing weenie like I am, and you come from a background of having to do things like data mining on and, and natural language parsing and crazy stuff like that, um, having really good regular expressions is really important to you. One of the main reasons that I went from Python to Ruby years ago was the fact that I felt that Python's regular expressions were just clunky and hard to use. They weren't as natural as Perl's were, for instance. Um, and you know, Ruby married this concept of really quick, there's a regular expression literal, you could use it really quickly. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's, it was missing some really, really cool features from you know, this newer ideas of, uh, of regular expression engines. And Onigurama, which has been available and is actually built into, uh, into TextMate, TextMate uses it. Um, and there's some other libraries like uh, Ultraviolet, which is syntax highlighting library, which, uh, which uses it as well. You can use it from 1.8. Um, it's now um, integrated into 1.9. So it gives you cool things like name grouping and various look aheads and look, look behinds and stuff like that. It also has support for encodings, which is obviously a really important feature. So that's kind of a cool feature. Uh, some differences with enumerables. So this really goes to and the enumerators. So this concept of an enumerator object that you can get off of some enumerable method. And in Ruby 1.8, you have to require a numerator, and it's a little bit different. Um, in 1.9, um, all the enumerator methods, all the enumerable methods, actually, if you call them without a block, they'll return an enumerator, and you can do things with that enumerator. You can call next on that enumerator. Uh, on that enumerator. I know at one point it actually held a, I think it held a lambda, which actually held the operation that it was doing. I'm not sure if that's true anymore. Um, but one of the cool things is you've got with index. So now people can stop complaining about not having hash each with index, which has been a constant complaint for, for years. So now you have it. You can even add your own crazy, uh, crazy things onto a numerator if you'd like and extend it. So 
However, what this does, and I didn't mention this in the, I didn't mention this with the with the risk factors, is it does change things like each with index and stuff like that. So you have to be aware of those as well. So uh, dot instead of underscore. And if you use our spec, um, you're kind of confused about where to use a dot and where to use an underscore and where to use a space anyways. So you'll probably figure it out just fine. Um, enumerable. So there's some other cool things that you can do. Um, you're familiar with symbols to proc from, from Rails, from, act, uh, from active support. Um, that's now in 1.9. Some people hate, hate it, some people love it. Um, depends on who you ask. But um, there's also something re reduce, which is essentially the same thing as inject. And actually, I think it is the same thing as inject. I don't know. Yep, I, I'm getting a nod, so that's, that's a yes. And uh, you can pass it either a symbol um, or a symbol to proc. And it will, essentially, if you're, familiar with, if, you're, if you're familiar with functional languages, you'll think of these as essentially kind of like a fold. And it just flattens things down. This is, you can think of this like dot sum as well. There's also a whole bunch of cool features like that. Um, there's a whole bunch of new, new methods on enumerable that it, it, it makes sense to take a look at. Some of which are here. Um, so cool things like take and group i. Um, group i is now um, part of Ruby, which is, which is nice. Um, min by and max by. So back in the old days, you only had sort, and then you got sort by, and it was really excited. And then now you have min by and max by. Um, you can do a count, which I believe is essentially a, a select dot size. Um, so kind of new things there. This is just take and drop a way to just grab something out real quick. So hash changes, at least is the last time I checked. Um, Hashes are actually, they, they track their insertion order. So you can actually go over a hash in the order that it was, things were inserted. This is probably familiar to those people that have used PHP um, and have um, associative arrays, that kind of thing. So you can see I'm putting stuff in, I'm taking stuff out, I'm putting more stuff in, and things are, things are staying ordered. So, um, tap. Tap is a little thing on object. If you're familiar with active support, it's uh, returning. This is very, very familiar. This is very similar to returning. This is another one of those things that people say is horrible because of performance, um, because of, you know, those microseconds slipping away from them. Um, so, just be aware it is there. Um, and it's kind of neat. If uh, you're not familiar with returning, what it's really doing is it's passing itself um, to that block. You can do stuff with that block, and it gets returned. This is kind of cool for, for, especially for things where you're fiddling with an object in a method and returning that object back, and you're doing some type of configuration on that object. But you don't want to have to. You want the bounds of of the uh, of the scope to be very very explicit. You know, even though the method you know is pretty explicit, but it's kind of a neat thing. So this is probably the thing that when people think when 9 immediately comes to the, to the front of their mind. And it's this new proc literal. And you'll forgive me if I use the words proc and lambda interchangeably, because in my mind, they are interchangeable. And uh, lambda is what I actually usually call them. So, so the, the, main, the main thing here is, and I'm going to fall back into a terminal, and we can go over this stuff, and uh, we can try out various permutations. By all means, I want to have you guys ask, ask questions. Um, one of the main things here is that we actually now, versus us having uh, lambda, which is a method that you pass a block to, um, that you get a proc out of, you actually now have something that's built into the parser um, to create these. And it is a lot more flexible than the, um, than the goal marker type um, lambda blocks because you can actually do things like it can actually receive blocks itself, which you couldn't do before, and you can do things like default arguments, optional, optional arguments as well, uh, which is nice. So you can pass blocks to them, um, and you can do default arguments to them. 
Uh, as you saw earlier, you can do things like declare things as local variables, which is this kind of arcane thing, um, which is very experimental. And I'm going to, well, I'm certainly going to um, talk a little bit about, a little more about those in a, in a while. So I thought I had another slide, but I guess I don't on that. I will uh, pop out to a terminal. So simple changes. Uh, we've got two proc now, like I mentioned. Um, in general, there's less sibling rivalry between symbols and strings, which if you um, have worked, you know, Rails created this idea that you use symbols all over the, all over the place, especially for things like keys and hashes. Um, but you also had stuff coming in from parameters that were strings, and you were doing comparisons, and especially when you were trying to do things like index into the things, um, it would fall all over itself. So now you can actually, it will pretend to be a string um, in certain ways. I know they, I know that the idea of symbols actually being frozen strings were, was flirted with, and I think that was removed due to performance concerns and probably other concerns as well. Um, but now they at least kind of pretend to be the same. You not, can't use double equals um, to check them because you know they are different objects. So that's. That would probably be a little bit too much, um, but triple equals does work. So things like case statements work, um, which is nice. So threads. Um, threads have moved to a, a, a native threading model from a, from a user threading model. Um, there are actually three different models. If you open up thread.c, um, because you do stuff like that for some reason, you like C code a lot, um, and, and read through, there's actually three different models that have been thought of, and one of which is users, user threads, and one of which is uh, one of which is native threads with a big giant VM lock, and another one is with finer grain locks. Um, the one I believe that's been built in right now is Model Two. Um, I don't read a lot of C, um, you know, as, as in my leisure time, um, so I. And I'm also not a VM guy, so I haven't dug in very, very deep with exactly what the status is. I know that's been changed back and forth over various, various times. Um, but when 191 comes out, hopefully this Christmas, um, you know, maybe we'll we'll have locked down a little bit. This uh, is is kind of cool to have. It's kind of cool to run Ruby, kick off a bunch of threads, the performance being much better, and then going to take a look at top, and and seeing the difference in uh, the thread count. So. So this has been another one of those checkboxes that we've needed. And um, especially for people coming from the Java world, this is something that like, it, they couldn't believe that they were in this wonderful language that didn't have this feature that they absolutely needed. Um, you know, and it's, it's been something that's, um, that's kind of hounded us. So fibers. Um, fibers um, are essentially semi-coroutines. And you can kind of think of them as lightweight user level threads that you manually schedule, um, I guess, is kind of a, a way of thinking of it. Uh, semi coroutines is, I believe, a phrase that comes out of the Lua language uh, originally. Um, there are a few uh, projects that use it. Um, Revactor, which is an actor framework, if you're familiar with Erlang and actors, um, it's really neat to me, especially. Um, primarily focused on, on the I.O. side of the house. Um, but, but pretty neat. Neverblock, which recently came out, I believe, also. Um, the 1.9 version, at least, sits on top of fibers. I think they have some 1.8 stuff. Also, this isn't, this is a real, one of those cool things that I think is really, really cool, but in a very abstract way of, oh, someday I'd like to have a problem that that will solve. Um, generally, when I do Ruby stuff, I'm not doing stuff with threads. Maybe born out of some kind of fear of the or old thread model. Um, but also, those aren't my, the problems I generally solve. If I did solve them, I might think about other languages because I like having a toolbox. So there are a number of um, good blog entries to read on fibers. Um, there's a number of articles that are out. InfoQ has a fairly decent article. Um, Dave, Dave has a really good series of, of, uh, of articles on fibers, and David Flanagan has kind of an explanation. <coughs> so we're going to go into questions. Um, we have about 15 minutes, it looks like. Um, so, questions? Yes? Can you 
I don't think I can explain the history behind the tap method. Uh, Matt's may be willing to talk about that uh, here later this week, but I will tell you the, a little bit of the history of, I guess, I guess the tap method was driven at least in, in part by returning, I would assume. There seems to be. Yeah, this kind of reminds me, uh, tap kind of reminds me of uh, small talk semicolons for, for some reason as well. Um, the ability to chain things on to the same, to the same object. It, it, uh, I can't really tell you why it's called tap. Um, yeah, I guess you tap into the chain. It also kind of reminds me of jQuery, the end stuff in jQuery. You can kind of go back, but in a less way that makes, a way that doesn't make me vomit as much. But, although I like jQuery. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know about the entomology of it, but the, from a, from usability perspective, um, it owes a lot of, at least why it's cool to people uh, to, to returning. There's, there's a good subset of people in the Rails community that, that use returning as a, as a pattern. Yeah. Yes, Tamar. Um, sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I uh, just I wondered if you could give us your opinions, just your personal opinions on the changes that happened to Lambda, uh, specifically, well, just, just the, the, the formatting changes. Yeah, okay. Um, so, at first, I really hated it. I really hated it. Um, I think par partially that's because I, um, I've been using Ruby so long that I see any change is a scary thing to some degree. Um, but, so yeah, at, fir at first I really hate it. But at the same time, I use functional languages. And functional languages usually build this in at a much closer level um, than object-oriented programming languages do. Um, I love lambdas. I love, because I have a background in functional languages, I, I, I love them. Um, okay. So at first it kind of took me back. Because I also worked in, worked in the Perl world for a while. And I really hate the mentality that we should try to make things as obscure as possible to read. Um, I, I really like elegant code. And I felt like the more punctu there's, you know, the idea of the more punctuation that you add to your code, the less readable it is. It's the whole brevity versus clarity kind of seesaw. Um, that being said, the, the one thing that, uh, the thing that kind of over time has made me feel more comfortable with it, and, and now I really, really like it, um, is, well, first of all, the utility. So aside from bike shedding uh, Matt's and the, the, the team on whether or not the argument should come before the arrow or after the arrow, because I'm a language designer and I know all that stuff. Because um, everybody's a language designer. So besides that discussion, um, the utility is, is, there's so many more cool things that are possible because you can do stuff, um, like have blocks being passed to Lambda. Like whole new thing, whole, whole new, um, use cases, well not in use cases, but, but whole new patterns are going to emerge out of this in, in the Ruby community. And the Ruby community is really good at building patterns. So that's really exciting to me. Um, and I'm hoping the Ruby community self-regulates to some degree. Uh, when we you know, do things like, I don't know, I, I recommend ostracizing people for, for horrible lambdas. Um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe we can come up with some kind of punishment. I don't know, some schedule of punishments that we, that we can do. Um, it does bring up the possibility that people are going to just come up with this crazy, crazy stuff. I have always hated the fact that there's this word lambda that doesn't flow. Um, Dave, uh, in, a, in an article a few weeks ago, talks about name scopes um, and the fact that that arrow is a lot clearer because you can just read across and there's no lambda word that catches you up. It's like when you're reading blocks and sometimes you hit do, and sometimes that do makes sense, and sometimes it just seems weird. Um, lambdas are a little bit cleaner. Now, granted, when you do things like are declaring variables as local, and you're using some of those advanced features, lambdas become hell um, with this. I mean, it just, the, I didn't even talk about dot call, really. So let me go back a little bit. So, um, yeah, I totally just glossed over this. So looking on the left-hand side, or we, we pick, pick one. Um, see, the first line there, what I'm doing is I'm assigning a new lambda to M. The second line there 
what I'm doing is I'm invoking M. And in 1.8, what you would do is you'd say m.call. Um, this is a shortcut for m.call. I call this dot .call just because I'm really hoping that you know, people will pick it up. And uh, I don't know, I'll have some, kind of, some amount of fame out of coming up with a name for something, like hash rocket. Maybe I'll build a company out of it. Um, it'd be really cool, dot .call. I could spend $15,000 on a logo. It would be neat. Um, I love those guys. So, the, uh, so that's a nice shortcut. It's weird, though. You know, it, it, takes, it takes a bit of time. So I recommend that you let this stuff, before you come up with any really strong opinions, that you kind of just let it sit there for a little bit and, and uh, you know, play with it and get a feel for it before you decide you hate it or you love it. So, does that kind of answer your question? Hello. Uh, we got questions on the mic, please. Can, can you hold off? Oh, sorry. I'm going to let Jim. One question, thanks. I'll let, I'll let Jim do it. Cool. So, hey. So, I'm you I do Merb some of the time. So, what I'm worried about these days is that um, sort of the JSification, the JavaScriptification of Ruby, where, so a lot of people are like, it's going to become fragmented and things are going to get out of control and. Um, we're not going to have Ruby, but if you look at JavaScript, something else actually happens, which is that there's a core that is JavaScript, and then every interpreter a adds stuff to it, and what people end up having to do is writing um, code that says, if you're in IE, do it this way, and if you're in Firefox, do it this way, and if you're in Safari, do it this way. And so that's my personal worry, is that people will have to write, if you're in JRuby, do this, and if you're in... Um, if you're in Rubinius, do this, and if you're in MRI, do this. And it seems like 1.9 has the potential to further complicate that mess of, it doesn't seem like 1.8 is going away, but if 1.9 actually has any adoption, it seems like code is going to have to exist that forks. Yeah. And that seems like it would suck. Yeah. Um, actually, Sam, Sam Ruby slides, one of the things that he mentions in several, several cases is he guards sections of his code by checking something, like whether or not string responds to encoding and things like that um, as a really easy way. Of course, you can just check Ruby version. Um, yeah, I mean, that's my fear in general. I think that fear is almost completely separate of, of 1.9. It's my fear of implementations. Um, let's not pretend that the Ruby parser is, is easy reading in 1.8 either, because it's not. Read parse.y. But yeah, 1.9 is a whole new set of syntax features that people will add or won't add. Um, yeah, and if you're, if you're trying to work in one environment and push up to another environment or share code via gems, yeah, I mean, that's a real problem. You already have that problem in, you already have that problem in HPRCOT, and you already have that problem in JSON, where they've taken the Regal parser and made Java versions of the Regal parser and native versions of the Regal parsers. Um, so that, yeah, that already exists, and I don't, know, I don't know if there's any easy answer to that. I don't think 1.9 really makes that worse, besides the fact that 1.9 is just another version that we'll have to wait to see if people ever catch up to on their implementations. Because um, like I said, everybody's targeting 1.8 right now anyhow. Um, and I'm sure 1.8 will exist for a long, long time, uh, especially in production environments. I, I think it's, it's, a reasonable, it's a reasonable concern. Next question, Jim. So with um, hashes having an order, is there a way to control the order, sort, reverse, unshift, I don't know uh, if there's any way to make indexing? Order. I don't, I don't know if there's any way to make the order to restick it some other way, uh, besides removing elements and adding elements, because it's insertion order, uh, or declaration order, I guess, when you're, when, you're, when you're putting it together. I don't know if there is in PHP, if anybody's really familiar with PHP, which also has a similar kind of structure. Um, yeah, I'm not certain. I'm not certain on that. Matt's might be able to answer that question uh, later, this, later during the conference. Every now and then when I'm uh, paying attention, um, I see a, a, a deprecation warning of um, invocations without parameters. Oh, OK. Well, what is that? And is that going to happen? I don't know if we're always getting that, even with a single argument, or are you getting it with multiple arguments? I've, I just, just I, don't really, I didn't really pay attention. I've seen, this, I've seen the text come across the console, but I'm wondering if that's actually something that's going to be, you well, know, for real. You're declaring your methods without parentheses, right? You're not doing maybe, def foo bar, because that's, 
<laughs> verboten. Yeah, don't do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly in cases where you're invoking a method and you're passing multiple arguments, and Ruby's worried that it's going to be a little bit ambiguous or it might change the rules. I haven't seen any for invoking, you know, period, um, you know, with 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 a single argument or something that's very clear, simple argument list. I haven't seen a warning. Um, it's possible I've just missed it. So that's another thing that maybe we can look at. It's really handy, by the way, to have to be talking about one nine and have match right here, and be able to look over here and have him nod. And then, if I don't know the answer to a question, say talk to him later. I, I just love that system. <laughs> can we fly him in every time? That'd be great. Um, great. We got time for two more questions. Two more questions, please. Any anyone else? Got a surplus. Awesome. Okay. So. Huh? Um, if anybody has any questions about 1.9 later and you're too embarrassed to talk in public, um, you, can, you can talk to me later. So thank you, Matt, um, very much. And uh, Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.